If crime noir, pulp fiction, and dark, gritty comics had to find a place of meat and mate, it had to be Frank Miller's astoundingly brilliant mind. It ought to be one of the most celebrated names in the conversation. Strap in as we delve into all 13 issues of Miller's CD world of Basin City, or as it's more commonly hailed, Sin City. Issue number one. Let me just tell you beforehand that although the first issue is pretty damn important from a narrative standpoint and draws our attention to the tragedy behind the main story, little else happens plot-wise. Now that we've established that, let's cut to the chase. So, the tone is set grim from the get-go, and we follow the story from the eyes of an imposing and battle-weathered man who happens to be in the arms of an attractive companion. The two proceed to have an intense night of intimacy, as the man's inner soliloquy reverts back and forth between praising her angelic appeal and sheer bewilderment. Well, he was absolutely surprised about why a woman like her would want someone of his demeanor. To him, it seemed bizarre, as someone so attractive would never usually find any appeal in a brutish hunk of a man, scarred all over from years of fighting. The real shock comes to him as he wakes up from his drunken oblivion three hours later. Goldie, as the woman's name is revealed to be, lay lifeless beside him on the bed. An ominous gut feeling comes over the man, who's now convinced that the death of this mysterious and beautiful woman was someone's deliberate doing. He suddenly snapped back to reality as he hears the police sirens blaring. The killer, being thoroughly meticulous, had left no trace of the murder, and to our protagonist's surprise, had alerted the cops as well, since no one should even be aware of the death having occurred at that point. Assessing the situation quickly, he ends his reverie with a resolve for retribution and prepares to make a getaway. He knows that the cops would certainly pin the death on him, as he's an ex-convict who would make for a perfect fall guy. He steals his nerves as there's neither time to hide nor the opportunity to keep up the air of an innocent citizen. The issue ends as he buckles his trench coat, getting ready to face the police. Head on. Issue 2. The next issue opens with the protagonist who's named Marv, resolving before Goldie's sprawled body that a killer would pay for what they did. The police, who appear to be heavily clad in vests akin to that of a SWAT team, storm up the stairs, armed to the teeth with heavy weaponry. Marv thinks that someone put them up to the center of this crime scene, having paid a hefty sum to have him framed. Ingesting some pills he's had in his trench coat pockets, Marv grins as the police, having reached the doorstep, demand to be let in. In a tremendous burst of brute strength, Marv smashes the door on his way out, knocking a few of the personnel over. A bullet grazes his shoulder, leaving a telltale dent in the wall behind as he manhandles an officer, driving his head to the wall. He then proceeds to leap off the stairway banisters, evading another gunshot being fired his way. Dexterously arresting his fall, he swings into a lower story, crashing headfirst into the steps of the staircase while his flying trench coat is riddled further with holes being ripped into it by incoming gunfire. Shattering a million shards of glass, he leaps out of a stairway window into the night, landing on a heap of garbage below. His fall cushioned by the huge dump of trash, he springs back on his feet, only to find a police car straight ahead, glaring its headlights in his face. Undeterred by the obstacle, Marv nimbly jumps atop the bonnet, shattering the windshield with his legs to enter the vehicle. In a matter of seconds, Marv disposes of the two police personnel inside and makes his getaway in the now stolen police car. As he revs furiously through the night, he reflects how he's in the dark as to how and why Goldie was killed. Thinking of her as someone who brought him warmth and company when he needed it the most, despite never having met her before that night, he promises to bring vengeance upon her killer. As he dumps the car in water, driving it over the edge of a pier, he thinks to himself that he would ensure the killer meets their end in a gruesome and painful manner unlike the fate that Goldie herself had to suffer. We see his imposing figure swim away from the sinking vehicle as he contemplates how the punishment that he would exact upon her killer would be a loud and nasty kind of a kill. A kill of his kind. Reveling at the thought of inflicting pain upon his unknown adversary, he seems to relish how he'd laugh in the face of the killer as he imagines them whimpering like a baby before him. In the final panel of this issue, we see Marv's now battered and contorted face as he swims further away while immersed further in his vengeful resolve. His thoughts are bent upon his love for Goldie, almost as a sort of twisted muse who is forever lost. Issue 3. Marv weighs his options about his exit out of this submerged predicament. He knows that probably two dozen cops have reached the pier, their guns ready to aim for the kill if he manages to surface. However, he seems to know how to make a clean getaway as he swims his way into a pipeline. Creeping into what seems to be a sewer drainage, he glides into the metallic cavern, only to end up in the city sewers. He makes his way out through a porthole while laying low, if only momentarily, in a seedy alleyway. He surmises that he must get to someone called Lucille, as he thinks she knows what he needs. Avoiding a strolling cop on patrol, he makes his way out of the darkness by climbing the walls of a building. Showing immense athletic prowess, he finds his footing up the walls, clawing at little nooks and crannies of the bricks. Soon enough, 
he perches himself on top of a narrow ledge, adjusting into a precarious traverse into what seems like someone's room. Inside, Lucille is woken up. Sensing an intruder, she loads up her revolver, ready to confront whoever had managed to break in. To her relief, she finds that it was Marv who snuck in, presumably through a window from the ledge. Marv, in his heavily battered appearance, reassures that he was only grazed by bullets and asks if she has some beer to give him. Lucille refuses the request, saying that she wouldn't want to give him alcohol at all and that she guesses that's not something Marv has come to her for in the first place. We learn that Lucille is Marv's parole officer and she hands him some pills with the remark that he's worse without the medication. As they exchange words, Marv explains how he's been on the run from the cops, getting involved in the violent encounter in the process. The pills in question come from her psychiatrist girlfriend, who had at some point tried to analyze Marv to no avail as he was too intimidating. A visibly vexed Lucille inquires if Marv had actually killed policemen in the fight, to which he says no, adding the fact that he had, however, given them one hell of a battle. The seal exclaims in contempt at how she'd handle this mess with her superiors, which triggers Marv even further. He goes on to say how the mess he was involved in was far from something as petty as a barroom brawl. He was in the middle of something big something over which a lot of blood would be spilled. Concerned about his mental state after his time in prison, Lucille reminds Marv that this fiasco could end with him behind bars for life, which would just be hell anew. In a chilling declaration, Marv's anguish and scarred emotions surface as he says that hell isn't being physically traumatized. Rather, it's the utter void of rhyme or reason, the dread of existence. That was what hell meant for him, as his emotional connection with Goldie had finally given him the purpose to know what he was living and breathing for. We follow Marv's silhouette across the city cityscape as he makes his way to his trusted weapon, a gun he'd named Gladys. On the way, however, he realizes that he'd have to sneak past his old mother, who had gone blind but had developed an immaculate sense of hearing as a result, sitting alone with his thoughts. Marv realizes that his mother hadn't changed a thing about his room as the ambience of old familiarity hits his brooding nostalgia. As he'd surmised, his old mother had heard him come. As the old lady called out tenderly to her son, she explained that some people, who weren't cops, had visited, looking for Marv. Dismissing her worries, he says that they were from a new job that he'd managed to land. As the elderly woman felt Marv's scarred face, she was understandably concerned if he was getting mixed up in trouble. With Marv attempting to dismiss it again, his mother asks if there's something that he's been keeping from her. In a bittersweet ending to this issue, the mother and child share a tender moment, as Marv explains that there's a girl who he's met, Goldie. Issue 4 The next issue opens with Marv's quiet reflection about the turmoil he finds himself in. In his mind, he renders it akin to a jigsaw puzzle, of which he seems to be short on pieces. He reminisces about when he used to be good at jigsaw puzzles back in school, where he used to be considered a genius by his mentally disabled friend, Chuck. The jigsaw puzzle he finds himself in consists of a grand scheme of entrapment. The police are in cohorts with someone who wants to frame him for the death of his love, Goldie, and the greatest missing piece that eludes him is the true killer. The good news, however, he thinks is that the killer wasn't taking a back seat in this drama. They'd sent people to look for him, as Marv's mother explained, and if he's lucky, he might just get his hands on more pieces of this cryptic puzzle when they inevitably show up again. To find what he's looking for, he starts exploring the crime-ridden alleyways of Sin City. One of these dark alleys leads him to a familiar place. As he's about to enter this familiar nightclub, a place owned by his old acquaintance Katie, a bouncer stops him as he kicks out another customer from the inside. Making a comment about Marv's disheveled appearance and weather trench coat, the bouncer demands that he leaves immediately. Marv, ever being the bigger bully in the room, gouges the man's eyes and proceeds to nonchalantly walk in. We get to find out that the owner, Katie, runs this place like most of the other places in Sin City, by bribing the cops and overcharging the people, that is. For Marv, however, things go differently around there as he's helped her dispose of many enemies in the past, which is to say that he gets his drinks for free. Marv happens to take a liking to Katie's place for other reasons too, however. For one, it's the kind of country ambiance that suits his palate. He seems to resent the contemporary country taste, and Katie seems to have just the kind suited to his leanings. Another reason, however, would be Nancy, the dancer, and that night she seems to be grooving to her favorite song, Driving Wheel. Marv remembers when a night when he's been enamored by Nancy's luscious body, but also acknowledges that he wasn't here for that now, not this time. This time, it would seem he's hopped in this on the lookout for a particular character, short and hairy. This man whom Marv towers over is simply referred to as Weevil. It becomes clear soon enough that Marv wants this Weevil person to go around town and spread the word that Marv has been frequenting various pubs and joints, hopelessly drunk and grieving over a dead woman. Goldie. Intimidated, his unlikely emissary runs off to do his bidding, while Marv orders a shot and a brew for drinks. Issue 5 A breathtaking silhouette of the dancer Nancy sets the tone of the room where Marv is having his drink. The flamboyant moves don't suppress the underlying darkness of this shady world, as soon enough, we see someone hold a revolver to Marv's back. Far from being perturbed, 
He simply comments that this sudden intruder had a rather nice coat. These happen to be two hitmen who escort Marv out into the same alleyway that he came in from. Maintaining his grin, Marv keeps jabbing at his company about how expensive his coat looks and how that must have set him back quite a lot of bills. His inner thoughts, however, couldn't be more different. He thinks to himself that he loves squaring up with hitmen, since it doesn't tug on his moral strings to do them any harm. In fact, he thinks the worse he would harm them, the better it would feel for him. A violent confrontation must have become very obvious to others as well, since Katie succinctly turned up the music to drown out any noise from the eventual scuffle. With one last quick jibe about the coat, Marv gets to action. In the fraction of a second, his foot twists backwards to trip over his captor as he instantly arrests the latter's arm, immobilizing it in his grip. The firearm is now his to maneuver. Before the second hitman can even process whatever had happened, a quick shot from the revolver flings the pistol off his shattered palm. Marv takes care of the one in his clinch by mercilessly slamming his face to the dry wall while firing off three more shots to disable the other. Slumped to the ground and bleeding from the belly, Marv's victim whimpers as he's commanded to take off his coat. Clearly, Marv wasn't kidding around with his compliments. The man was bleeding out on the expensive piece of clothing, and Marv was going to have none of it. When he does as he's told, Marv wears the coveted coat on his own person and fires another shot to the man's guts, leaving him to bleed out in even greater pain. A grueling questionnaire session begins. Convinced that these attackers weren't the ones that killed Goldie, Marv demands to know who sent them after him. The bleeding thug begs not to be killed, to which he's promptly greeted by a solid whack in the nose with a gun. Marv assures him that he's already had his fate sealed, since he'd be bleeding out to death. Anyway, with that being said, Marv offers him the age-old choice of a painless, quick, merciful death versus an even more tormenting and painful fate. Putting up no further resistance, the man spills the beans. It was someone by the name of Telly Stern, a sort of boss who called the shots at another place called Triple Ace Club, who had put them up to the task of dealing with Marv. Not wasting a breath, Marv shoots the hitman between his eyes, granting him instant death. Before he's about to leave, however, he picks up whatever money he gets on their person, only to have something shocking happen at just that very moment. Just for a second, Marv picks up a whiff of a certain scent, a scent that he's only ever known to belong to Goldie. As he considers this, he quickly disposes of the thought, chalking it up to his delusions creeping up on him. The truth was more enigmatic, though, as we see a woman witnessing this entire event from the shadows. What's more, her appearance bears an uncanny semblance to that of Goldie's. Unbeknownst to Marv, we see her resolute features muttering a promise that the man before her would pay for what he had done. Issue 6 The day is restless as Marv's restless body twists and shifts under the sheets as he lies clearly in the midst of a futile attempt to catch some sleep. Neither the incoming noises of the street nor the filthy stench of the $9 bedding arrangement he'd made for himself seems to rob him of his sleep, though he admits that he's too excited, far too excited to catch a wink of sleep. To add to that, he resents the fact that there isn't anything worthwhile to do, such as watching a game on the TV to bide his time as he waits. He waits for the night to come crawling over the city as the prying eyes drift away with the receding sunlight. The night does come crawling, and the anonymity of the shadows renders the streets into his ideal hunting ground. The air gets colder as the hierarchies of power and influence over Sin City shift over from the affluent to the violent. Marv is excited. All of the night slaughters lay ahead of him, all the pain he would inflict on his warpath. Yeah, it was going to be a night when spilt blood was going to be paid in full with broken bones. A frantic face begs to be spared as Marv's fists batter it into pulp. He's unleashed himself upon this city and its sinful mire of a people. His basest instincts have reared their heads once more as he treads the night trading bruises for answers and brawls for leads. He's enjoying every second of it. The scene cuts to another man's head being shoved down a toilet bowl, gasping and choking for air as Marv torments his victim into cooperating. Scanning every nook and cranny, he roams the city as he feels like it's one of the many attractive broads that begs for everything he can give. He's ecstatic. Dragging yet another victim's face along a pavement as he revs up a car, he declares that he's having a blast beating the living souls out of everyone in his way. He's made his way into a church. At the confessional booth, a pastor inquires about what sins he's come to confess. Marv doesn't have much to say. He admits his hands are drenched in blood and that he's wiped them clean before making it to the house of worship. The father figures out that this is his metaphorical way of confessing up to his crimes, or so it would seem. Marv was only out for his answers. The pastor's eyes widen in horror as Marv says he's killed three men that night, but not without a session of gruesome torture. But the terror sinks its fangs deeper into the man's soul as he's told the full extent of the information that Marv has been able to force out of people. Working his way up the rungs of the criminal ladder, he reveals having found and interrogated Connolly, the money man who has ratted out the Padre's involvement in this chain. Marv cocks his gun and coerces the priest to sit down. Following another attempt at maintaining his cover as a man of God, he sees that Marv was not 
not want to be deterred, he wants a name. The priest does comply, giving him the name of someone called Rurk and the location of a farm at North Cross and Lennox. Although Marv thinks this new lead is nothing but garbage, the Padre dares him to go and find out for himself, if he can. As if trying to warn Marv against the doom that awaits him there, the priest wants him to ask himself if Goldie's corpse is worth dying for. Marv answers by shooting his brains out, convinced that his quest was worth killing for, even worth going to hell for, as he mutters out an amen to himself. Issue 7 Our bloodlusted protagonist treads down the church's flight of stairs in his characteristic heavy gait and an even heavier trench coat. Stooping down to light up a smoke, he's immersed in his thoughts. He feels like there's hardly anything much better in life than a smoke after it's been a while since the last one, such as after a movie or after church. The realization even perturbs him as he just sits with the fact that he'd murdered a priest. He's pried the father's car keys from him, which he notices to be those of a Mercedes. Interestingly enough, we can see Marv's penchant for the old-fashioned things as he expresses expresses his disdain for the modern car designs, much like his earlier mental notes about country music. As he tries to unlock the deceased priest's vehicle, he's suddenly jolted back to reality by the screeching of another incoming car. Headlights blaring in his face, he reaches into his trench coat for his gun. As the vehicle quickly swerves, we catch a glimpse of the woman behind the wheels. Marv steadies his aim but freezes on the spot as the driver's face is oh, too familiar. The same frizzy hair. The same crystal eyes. Goldie. He freezes, in shock, as the smoke falls off his now agape mouth. The car thuds onto him, sending his behemoth physique tumbling over the bonnet. Before he's able to regain his footing, the woman swerves around for another attempt at a runover. Sure enough, the vehicle sends the dazed and confused Ma flying once again. Unrelenting, the car turns around yet another time, violently throwing his damaged body to the side as the woman inside fires several gunshots at the fallen man. She narrowly misses but continues to shoot as she speeds away. Bloodied, disheveled and bewildered at Goldie's look-alike and her violent onslaught, Marv gets into the Mercedes and retreats into his distraught confusion. Thankfully, he finds that the car he's just stolen has a state-of-the-art engine, despite its appearance being unappealing in his eyes. He thinks that his head is starting to clear, as once again, he attributes the vivid image of Goldie to his mind playing tricks on him. Reasoning with himself, he calms his mental struggle by thinking that he really shouldn't be skipping his medication. Goldie is dead, tells himself, and that's the reason he's out here doing what he's been doing. It's one thing when one's delusions stay minuscule, such as the time back at the alleyway when he picked up that scent. What bothers him even more is that such hallucinations have seemingly gotten out of hand with this incident of seeing someone who he knows for a fact is dead. Issue 8 The grim and dark figure of Marv's shadowy outline creeps through the night. He's in the woods, crawling stealthily, making his way through the ghostly tree trunks, against the thick undergrowth of shrubs sticking out stubbornly off the ground. He's on his way, following the lead that he found in the church. On his way, he disposes of the Mercedes in the parking lot of a diner, two miles from where the farm in question was situated. He doesn't take the Padre's warning lightly, as he discreetly treads off the roads and into the woods, so that he has the cover of a stealthy approach. He hates the woods, thinking to himself how people gush about the wonders and charms of nature. He thinks that those who maintain such a view have never been tied to a tree trunk and left there alone to spend the night. His deep-seated fear of the woods seems to stem from his experience that he's had a long time ago, presumably as a child. This trauma even seems to embed a sort of terror in his psyche, which would appear otherwise unlikely considering his bold and utterly fearless nature. Of course, there's not much else that scares him otherwise. In the lawless jungle, the predator feasts on the prey, although not unlike the twisted wilderness of Sin City's ecosystem in that way. The farm appears in the distance as the woods clear out. The creaking of a large windmill is the only sound that cuts through the silence. Ma crawls forward. The cold feeling in his gut, the very same one that told him that Goldie had been murdered, was back again. Over the many years of living on the edge, he'd learned to trust his gut. It was instinctive to him. It had become his second nature. Right now, it's been telling him that the farm is a bad place. It reeks of death to him. Nothing meets his gaze, well, at least nothing that's a dead giveaway. He looks for signs of this perceived malevolence here and there. Something that his ears might pick up. A whiff of an out-of-place scent, maybe, or the sight of something very little just out of the corner of his eyes. He was tense. The cold ball of ice in his gut, right where his stomach is supposed to be, gives him all the foreboding of a lurking malice. He hears a growl, a brooding growl that was slowly coming his way. Marv steadies himself as he sees a fierce-looking wolf approach. Remaining collected, he tries to get the message to the beast that he doesn't want to fight. To no avail, it would seem, as the animal pounces upon its prey. Marv, however, unloads a vicious uppercut to the wolf's underside, lifting it clean off the ground 
and follows it up with a devastating hook to its face. As the wolf lies knocked out cold, Marv checks to see if it's still alive. He didn't want to kill the animal, let alone use his gun on it. He does, however, feel curious about its owner, as there seems to be blood on its breath. Human blood. Looking around, he unearths some buried trinkets that catch his attention. But the danger is far from gone, as we see a shadowy figure keeping a stealthy eye on the distracted Marv. A balding head, an eerie smile and round-rimmed glasses framed against an uncanny pair of eyes. Marv finds a huge bone, something that looked like a human femur, as he's sure it didn't belong to a coyote. He then finds a lady's high heel shoe, but all of a sudden, he realizes in horror that he's been crept up on by someone. Shocked and startled beyond belief at the prospect of having someone successfully snuck up on him, he fails to react rapidly enough to draw his gun in time. The attacker, who seems to be wearing a pair of laced-up Converse shoes, lands a clean heel kick to Marf's throat. The strike lands with surgical precision, as Marf's flailing arm misfires the gun far off the target. As an immediate follow-up, the assailant drives a sidekick to Marf's jaw, as he helplessly proceeds to spit out blood. You know that this guy means business when he's able to overwhelm the monstrous Marv in hand-to-hand -hand combat, who we've already seen incapacitate multiple trained adversaries. In all fairness, Marv was taken by the element of surprise, but owing to his previous encounters with armed assailants, as well as close-quarter encounters with Hitman, we know just how skilled and dexterous the man truly is. But he's beaten, overcome, and pushed to even more dire straits as the opponent proceeds to disarm him by clawing at his wrists. With what could be sharp nail-like attachments to his fingers, he slashes at Marv's hand, taking his fingers out of commission. Further, he slashes at his eyes, taking out his sight. Lightning speed, laser-like precision, and godly levels of combat skill, this man seemed to have it all. Yet, he didn't make a sound. Not so much as a whisper or a heavy breath, even as this mysterious assailant dismantled such an utterly formidable opponent in Marv. So silent, just as silent as one would have to be to sneak into that fateful hotel room and take Goldie's life. This could only mean one thing. Marv screams out his realization as he puts two and two together. Goldie's killer remains quiet as he picks up a sledgehammer. Rendered blind and helpless, Marv can do nothing as his face is caved in by the massive swing of the hammer. He lies flat on his back as the unfeeling, uncanny gaze of the killer glares at the unmoving man lying before him. Issue 9 Anyone who's ever had the misfortune of being knocked out of the senses would surely go through the same stages of unraveling consciousness that Marv sees unfold in his mind. Following his devastating beatdown and the subsequent knockout into oblivion, we see his mind slowly drift back. His inner narration describes this as being left suspended in a void, a darkness that can only be likened to that of outer space only with no stars. Cold, black, and bottomless as he describes it, he's left feeling robbed of both the brain and the body. Then slowly but surely, the pain creeps back in. Shattered bones, jagged and dislodged, pierce the bits of flesh that they've sunk themselves in. It seems to him that these fragments of his body are like dancing leprechauns or a ring of bullies making a mockery of his fallen cell. Every ounce of the pain comes back to him as the reminder of his defeat, from the burst of flying sparks that his eyes conjured when the hammer hit his face, to the soft, lifeless corpse of Goldie, his goddess who had been murdered in his bed. Feelings return to him, as does his despair. He's failed Goldie, he thinks, as he realizes how her killer has outclassed him in every single way. It felt like the man was a natural killer, too quiet and too quick as getting taken out by him appeared as effortless as it would be to take out a girl scout. Yet, why didn't he go for the kill? Why was Marv still alive? Surely he was alive since he'd been adrift in all of these thoughts, but he could not help be puzzled about not knowing why he's still alive. Perhaps this is his hell to go to, never knowing, yet forever falling into the uncharted abyss. Overwhelming pain wraps up his entire being. It feels to him like the pain only streaks out from behind his eyes, finding out places to have its fun. The agony grows as the burning smell of antiseptic hits his nostril. Consciousness makes its way to him as he reaches for the light in the middle of this eternal void. Marv dives for the light. He wakes up, coughing blood, weakened by the physical strain of the beating. He finds himself captive in a room, empty except for the severed heads of women being hung out on the wall. To his surprise, he finds Lucille trapped in the same room with him, as she explains that their captor keeps the heads of his victims and eats the rest of the body himself. Lucille looks absolutely traumatized, as her eyes widen in terror. She keeps telling Marv about how the killer eats the bodies, leaving only the bones for the wolf and how he cooks the murdered people first. Marv tries to calm her down as he notes that she's clearly in shock and put his trench coat on her. As far as Lucille knows, the man who had held them captive only made women his victims. Her trauma becomes even more apparent as she recounts having been made to watch as the killer consumes the flesh off the corpses. In fact, her own hand is chopped off. She'd been made to watch him suck the meat off her fingers as well, all the while looking at the man's creepy smile. She panics at the thought and lets out a blood-curdling scream. Marv hugs her to help her settle down from her nervous delirium. When she does calm down, though, she asks for a cigarette. 
which Marv does happen to have on him. To his surprise, Marv finds Lucille surprisingly collected once she has the stress out of her system. Marv cannot help but wistfully think about Lucille's gorgeous body as she inhabits his giant trench coat. He remembers having expressed concern about her sexuality to her face once, which only resulted in him getting socked in the face. But that's the least of his concerns now. Marv climbs up to a window which was fortified by tough metal bars, while Lucille says that this is a big-time hitch they found themselves in. Whoever was behind it all surely must have some serious connections, even with the police department. The metal bars remain unmoving, even as Marv tries his luck by yanking at them with his entire body weight. Now Marv answers Lucille's question, saying how he's got to learn about Rook's involvement from the priest. Lucille finds it hard to believe just as Marv did before. That aside, Lucille is convinced that the culprit behind it all knew that she'd been investigating Goldie's background. Indeed, she happens to be a prostitute, something that Marv was still in the dark about. Far from being interested in Goldie's line of work, Marv asks Lucille about how she ended up in the killer's clutches. She recalls all of it happening quite out of the blue as she was walking to a car, seemingly having blacked out immediately after. All Lucille can remember from that moment is waking up in the captor's kitchen, paralyzed, following which she was made to witness the cooking of her own hand. She admits that it didn't hurt in the slightest, owing to the fact that she was completely unconscious while the deed was done. As she is about to explain what once again how she was made to watch this horrifying ordeal, Marv tells her to hush up as he just heard a car coming their way. Perched on the windows, he can tell that the approaching vehicle had a V8 engine equipped and that it was coming quite fast. At the same time, we see the figure of another man crouching outside the dungeon's window, and it seems like he calls out to the vehicle, which had arrived just then. It's revealed that the one manning the vehicle was none other than the attacker from before. Moreover, the man creeping outside of the window calls out to him by his name, Kevin, and asks him to come quickly. Marv realizes that he still doesn't have the answers about this mysterious killer. Why didn't he kill him? Who's he working for? All he seemed to have privy to him was his face, and now his name. Issue 10 The scenes of this haunting farmhouse shift from one dark place to another. The shadow of the windmill cast against the ground of this eerie, sinister hideout. An axe planted by its blade on a piece of log like a butcher's meat cleaver. A harrowing flight of steps leads down from the woodworked floors, down into the dungeons where the two people are presently held prisoners. The reinforced door to this prison is being shaken with a tremendous thud as Ma flings his mighty body over and over again against it in order to break out. Panting, exhausted Ma slides against the walls, slumping down on the floor, only to get back up to his feet again. He hurls himself against the metal frames of the gate once more, and cracks start to appear where the bolts are held in place. The overwhelming might of this giant finally makes the hinges yield crashing out of a collapsed door that's now given in to the incessant battering. Lucille watches with a smirk. As the two hurry out of the cramped cell, Marv notes how, for only a second, Lucille seems almost scared to leave. Out of nowhere, another sound greets them, the heavy, periodic staccatos of chopper blades. It seems that a police chopper is about to give them company. Marv makes his way out along the farmhouse fences as the landing chopper blows up a cloud of dust against his fleeing visage. Lucille feels akin to a soft, weightless, and tender kitten in his grasp as he readies a gun for the encounter that was upon them. A bunch of men, armed to the teeth, dismount the chopper. It seems that they're those heavily armored police troops, wielding automatic weaponry such as light machine guns. At their head is a bald man in a high-colored coat, his face tattooed and one ear pierced. Marv and Lucille take cover as the men swiftly cover the house, looking for the escaped prisoners. Marv notices that they're done checking the house and are about to come their way. He raises his arms, gun loaded and gripped firmly in his hand. All of a sudden, Lucille, who happens to think that the cops were out here as their allies, hits Marv behind the head with a boulder, knocking him down once again. She explains that his confrontational approach would end up getting them both killed and that they were better off simply cooperating with the law enforcement as required. She runs off to the incoming men, explaining that she's Marv's parole officer. The men seem to welcome this gesture without hostility, as they ask her where he was at the moment. She adds that he's lying unconscious, far from being a threat, so that there's no need to use lethal force to subdue or kill him. Marv, however, picks up the axe that we've seen before, unnoticed by everyone else. Even as Lucille explains that there's no reason to kill Marv, the tattooed leader says otherwise. He makes it clear that Marv was to be dealt with once they get him to spill out whoever he's been talking to. Surprised, Lucille can't do anything as the man pulls out his weapon and sprays her viciously with a barrage of bullets, brutally killing the woman. The mysterious leader continues to shoot her corpse as one of the police henchmen lets him know that Marv wasn't anywhere to be found. Before a response is warranted, however, Marv jumps on one of the guards, catching the group by surprise. Heaving through the team of combatants, kicks and grapples the men's weapons out of his way while he manages to subdue them in a terrifying display of brute strength. The frantic, confused men try shooting him, but he quickly dismembers the ones who have lost their footing, swinging his axe 
splitting skulls and blocking the incoming gunfire with the human shield of fallen bodies. Even as the leader tries in vain to shoot him down, Mark beheads the last of the henchmen as the former runs out of ammunition. It's man versus man now. The tattooed leader's eyes are gaping wide as Marv stands before him wearing his bone-chilling grimace. It's clear that the opponent's fate is now sealed as Marv makes his comment about the damn fine coat that the man is wearing. Issue alone. The next issue starts off with a brilliant vista of a downpour, adorning the murky skies of Sin City. A bridge stands cold in the background, very reminiscent in likeness to San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. Marv's thoughts give accompaniment to the rain, saying how it doesn't usually pour out there in Sin City. Even though most people seem to hate it when the clouds shower a torrential downpour on the city, it's a feeling Marv himself cherishes a lot. It helps him think. He likens the skies to a dreary desert which, if only rarely, coughs up this cold torrent that turns the streets into glass and sends chills down to the bone. It makes him more confident and reassured, as people who he deems smarter than he scurry away from the harsh elements of nature while he's left alone with no one in his way. The air, washed clean of the dust and smoke, electrifies his sense of smell. Icy droplets streak down the skin of his neck. He feels alive. He breathes in the crystal clear air, his nostrils clear up with each breath, and he walks. He treads the raining streets, trudging on to wherever his feet lead him to. Yeah, it helps him think. His eyes are still alert, peering out for a patrol car looking for him. He was a wanted man. He was on the run. He had a target on his back. Marv has cooled off in the downpour as it washes over his towering body continuously. He spreads out the puzzle pieces in the niche of his own mind, looking for the big picture and how everything fits together. But as if time and time again, his thoughts revert back to dwindling back on the cop that he'd just killed. And it's quite evident that he's referring to the tattooed man who took Lucille's life. Marv thinks back to how tough he was, but then again, so was he himself. To add to that, he was enraged out of his mind because of what the brute had done to poor Lucille. In order to get him to talk, Marv remembers, he had had to take his time to inflict the goriest of treatments on him, and it wasn't until he was chopping off entire body parts that the man decided to finally yield. But the one thing that the tortured thug revealed to Marv was enough to shake him to his core. He didn't believe the priest back in the church. But there it was, back again, the very same name, only uttered by a different mouth. Marv hasn't stopped shaking since he's heard it, not owing to the cold shower in the form of the rain, ah, but because of the gravity that the one name held, Rock. Just having been confirmed by two different sources, Marv couldn't help but accept it as the truth rather than some bizarre coincidence. But it was also something which was deeply hollowing out all of his sense of purpose. He wants to turn tail and run, to flee the city and remain in hiding and even forget everything about Goldie, Lucille, and the silently lethal Kevin just to start afresh. He knows that he's just as good as dead when up against Rook. It seems that the name is all too familiar to him, which would explain why both Lucille and Marv himself maintain such an air of outright denial when first learning of its involvement in their mess. Even someone as unhinged and terrifying as Marv himself admits that the name of Rook, rather the thought of having an adversary in him, makes him weak in the knees. It overwhelms him with fear, as he feels like throwing up or curling into a ball, crying like an infant. It makes him realize that for all the little worth that his life retained, ridden with drinking and brawls that is, he'd much rather be alive than face death. He realizes that he's no hero. It does come to him, however, why Goldie showered him with so much affection. It all made sense to him now. It must have been that she was mortally afraid, knowing that someone was out there to take her life. So she hit the streets, looking for the toughest man she could find, so that under the pretext of love, she finds in him a protector, a white knight to shield her from imminent danger. She wanted her hero, but Marv was far from it. He was no hero, he repeats to himself, and as burlesque and intimidating as she might have found him, Goldie was still dead, killed as her so-called protector lay blacked out and useless beside her. Yes, the rain had helped his thinking indeed. Marv finds his resolve back, looking at the one last chance at redemption ahead of him. He would be going up against Rook, and if that means dying, he'd die knowing he was on the right path for once in his life. Half the puzzle was solved, the other half concerns him. What's the connection between the Rook name and the serial killer at the farm? Why would they want to kill Goldie? Marv is now sure that once he has these reasons figured out, he'd no longer remain in the dark regarding exactly what to do and how. Now, Patrick Henry Rock is the name. A sort of godfather, owning Sin City with their fortune worth billions, the people have nicknamed him St. Patrick. The influence of the Rock family goes back to the early years of the city as well, making them Sin City's very own royal family. Throughout the generations,
generations, this family has produced the ones who would be calling all the shots in the city. As for the current line of their descendants, the family boasts a United States Senator, a State Attorney General, and Patrick Rook himself. Marv remembers how the sisters back at his school would never stop talking about the great philanthropic nature of the man. As it seems, he was successful in building up the image of a benevolent educator and man of God, someone who could have run for president but chose to serve God instead. He'd become a cardinal of the church, and Marv finds himself before a giant statue of his image, erected in stone. But from the shadows, this man has kept growing until he became the most powerful figure in the state, having overthrown mayors and elected governors as he pleased. Still, Marv can't help but be amused at the fact that his fate would be sealed over the killing of a prostitute. The idea grows on Marv. He liked the sound of it more and more, wishing the delivery of justice to stem from a cathartically insignificant crack in this impregnable fortress of power and stature. As the statue of Patrick Rourke towers ahead of him, Marv draws his gun and shoots at it in sheer contempt and disgust. His sadistic rejoicing gets cut short, however, when his own thoughts start to conflict. What if it's his mind playing tricks on him again? What if this entire plot is a concoction of his ailing psyche, deprived even of the treatment, as Lucille was now gone? Was he ending up into a psycho killer? Marv pauses. He knew he had to find irrefutable proof of Rook's guilt, otherwise it'd just be a senseless and unjust killing. The rain sputters to a halt. People, vehicles, and businesses resume on their tracks, picking up where they'd left off. Marv makes his way into Old Town, the part of the city fested with crime, sex workers, and, well, everything in between. Old Town is the reason that Basin City has earned its unflattering nickname. As it turns out, the Old Town happens to be the legacy of the Rook's great-grandfather, who would come up with reforming the city as he saw fit, as it was quickly on its way into desolation during the Gold Rush era. The man had spent a hefty dime to import escorts from the world over, so that Basin City was refined to be the hottest place in the area to be in. While it transformed the city, and in particular the Old Town block into a pleasure aisle, generations of escorts and courtesans passed down the tradition into the current age. That's where Marb is headed, where he'd already learned about Goldie's line of work from Lucille. Perhaps amongst the Old Town denizens, Goldie had retained some friends, or maybe even family. A gunshot rings out, the bullet piercing Marv's shoulder. His eyes widen up in shock as, once again, he sees before himself the specter of the woman of his dreams. In utter disbelief, Marv sputters out that the woman before him couldn't possibly be Goldie. Goldie was dead, but the frizzy-haired woman pulls the trigger once more and a single shot echoes. Issue 12. The bullet grazes Marv's forehead as his reality is sent spinning back into the void. He wakes up in captivity once again, this time in the company of the mysterious lookalike of Goldie's. Tied to a chair, shaken and coughing from the bullet wound, he sees the lady in front. Still convinced about his worsened state of mental delusion, he asks the image of his dead muse for forgiveness. He says he hasn't eaten, slept, or taken his pills for days on end, and that there's no one to blame but himself for being deluded to such an extent. Furthermore, he accepts that he's not smart enough in general, but even he can tell when he's been genuinely going crazy. In his mind, his hallucination is still ongoing, while in reality he must be lying in a gutter someplace in town, talking to himself. At this point, he can't even be sure of how to tell reality apart from his brain's concocted images. Since he can't trust his own sight, he sees no point in trying to leave things up to his judgment any longer. No sooner is he done saying this, that the lady smacks his jaw with her gun, hurling curses at him. Marv bursts out laughing as we get to see the other occupants of the room. They're all women, presumably sex workers who are dressed up in costumes catering to all sorts of kinks. One of them remarks that Marv must be crazy, laughing hysterically like that after being hit square in the jaw. Another one comments that he might just be faking the laughter and that the woman with the gun should hit him again. This last character calls her by the name of Wendy. Wendy whacks at Marv's face with the gun's barrel again without much effect. Marv, who continues to believe it's Goldie who's been hitting him, says gently that she shouldn't use the barrel to pistol whip someone, as it might damage it out of the casing, rendering the gun useless. This doesn't make Wendy too happy, as she proceeds to strike him again, following the proper protocol. This time, again, far from having the intended effect, Marv only sits there, but something strikes him this time around. Why did the other woman call her Wendy? Understandably vexed, Wendy snaps back at him, saying that it was because her name really was Wendy, and that Goldie was her twin sister. The two-way misunderstanding becomes clear to all of us, as we get to find out that Wendy thinks it was Marv who had harmed her sister that fateful night. Not just this, Wendy reveals that Goldie and six other girls were missing, as it seemed that she still didn't know about her sister's demise. Holding Marv hostage, she wants him to spill the beans regarding their whereabouts, followed by which she plans to kill him. This time, with the full picture in mind, Marv retorts violently at her stupidity. He exclaims that a girl of Goldie's Goldie's standards would never have considered herself safe in the company of a thug like himself, let alone Goldie. 
None of the others, including Wendy herself, would be let close enough to him for him to lay a finger on them. He explains that Goldie only ever chose his company because she believed that Marv would keep her safe from the ones who were truly out to get her. Further, Marv knows that the cops didn't lift a finger when the other girls went missing, and only swooped in to cuff him once they'd found a fall guy to look the part of a deranged killer. But here he was, beating up and killing his way to the truth while Goldie's own comrades had his intentions completely backwards. To the girl's surprise, Marv breaks out of the knot, adding to the dismay of the dominatrix of the group whose speciality had been doing the nuts. Wendy comes to the realization that Marv could have simply broken out of captivity had he wanted to, and instead sat there, taking the beating. Marv explains that he deemed it better to talk it out, as use of force would require him to hurt one or more of them, if push came to shove. He was too chivalrous for that it would seem, as he calmly states that he doesn't hurt women while lighting up a smoke for himself. They had all finally come to an understanding. Issue 13. The Denouement Draws Near. The End Is At Hand. The final chapter of the tale unfolds. Marth looks at his reflection, wiping the blood off his brow. He's muttering words of reassurance to himself, rather the monster in himself, urging the beast within not to screw up, not to mess everything up now that the stakes are at their highest. He steals himself, finds determination from within, hardens his instincts by thinking about death. He knows that he'd be lucky to receive a quick and painless bullet to the head, but <laughs> in all likelihood, things were gonna go the harder way. His life would end painfully as it snuffed out, bit by bit as painful vaults of the electric chair would send him off to hell, a tantalizing purgatory followed by the inevitable hell reserved for a psychotic murderer. But none of that would matter. If he could make the wrongdoers pay for what they've done, Marv would die knowing that he's going to the grave, a winner. He throws up several times from the thoughts of pain, death, and killing that lay ahead. He reaches for his gun, his trench coat, and his axe. Borrowing the dominatrix's pair of handcuffs, he sets out on the final leg of his quest, with Wendy beside him on her two-seater push. He's still mentally conflicted about her uncanny resemblance with Goldie, but of course he says to himself, she's the twin sister. Sure, she has the same hair, the same features, and even the same scent, but she's Wendy and Goldie is gone. He can't afford to let himself get confused about that. Wendy is equally shocked when Marv explains the situation with Kevin, the farmhouse serial killer, and the ever-enigmatic presence of Cardinal Rock looming over this mystery. But it doesn't strike her as too outlandish, though, as she explains that Goldie used to work at the clergy. With this new piece of information at hand, Marv struggles even more to piece the puzzle together, but soon finds him distracted by his company. Wendy lights up two cigarettes and gives Marv one. He tastes her lipstick on it, and can't help but be overcome with desire as his heart pounds heavily, yearning for the touch of Goldie's arms. But this was Wendy, and he steadies himself yet again. They make their way recklessly through the traffic, grazing past honking trucks and knocking over trash cans. They can't be bothered, as they both speed to their mission to avenge their love. Wendy is curious about Marv's strange attachment to her sister. This man barely even knew her, but she was ready to go through hell just to have his sense of justice served. Marv simply says that it's because Goldie was nice to him. Wendy still doesn't comprehend, as it would seem her sister was only acting out of her own interests of self-preservation. Marv doubles down on his beliefs, saying that she was nice to him, giving him something he didn't know existed. His brutish appearance has never been his ally. He hasn't even been able to buy love due to his repulsive look. The night was drawing to an end, and they decided to stop to catch some sleep and bide away the daylight hours. Unable to maintain his composure in bed, Marv reaches out to Wendy, thinking again that it was Goldie beside him, only to be slapped back to his senses. As the darkness returns, they set out once again. Marv has a shopping list for his game plan this time. They get some rubber tubing, gas, a saw, gloves, the handcuffs from before, and a line of razor wire. To add to that, he already had the hatchet, his trusted Gladys, and his mitts in his inventory. Marv is impressed by Wendy's quiet teamwork as she doesn't ask too many questions and helps him out in his scheme every step of the way. They pull up close to the farm once again. Marv instructs Wendy to keep the engine running in case they need to make a swift getaway. He also warns her that if he isn't back in 20 minutes, she should run away and not look back. Wendy leaves him, asking Marv to kill the man who had wronged both of them for good. Marv knows that Kevin is by far the better combatant, so he must rely on every dirty trick in the book to take him down. He's counting on the fact that Kevin would be instructed to stay in the farm, laying low, as the ones who call the shots are probably thinking Marv has made his way out of the city. He carefully unwinds the razor wire, something which he had his mitts for, since the wires cut through flesh and bone like butter. Marv sets up the wire trap with the gas canister in his grasp. He waits, watching the farmhouse from afar. He watches as Kevin's silhouette slowly appears, heading downstairs for a midnight snack. Marv knows only too well about his cannibalism to deduce what kind of snack it was going to be. Then, with lightning speed, Marv 
passes. He'd readied a makeshift fuse by hanging a piece of cloth out of the gas. He lights it up and launches it through the window. The insides of the farmhouse explode in an infernal ball of fire as Kevin barely manages to shatter his way out of the burning debris through a window pane. From his cover, Marv shoots round after round, having managed to gain the element of surprise on Kevin. The killer makes a dash for it, not yet properly hit by any of the bullets. But this is where the slickest part of Marv's trap comes in. He gets the cuffs ready as Kevin runs further toward the wires that he set up. Crossing his fingers, Marv hopes that the fiend doesn't look down at his feet and figure out the deadly trap he'd set up. To his disappointment, Kevin is smarter than anticipated and leaps over the wires. Flying in for a kick, Kevin is caught by surprise, however, as it turns out Marv had sprawled out his trench coat as a decoy. Hatchet and cuffs in hand, the two engage in a spectacular bout. Kevin's agility and claw-like extensions help him gain the upper hand, but this time, Marv endures the pain. He endures the blood gushing out of his eyes as he gets slashed with Kevin's talons. He endures the jaw-crushing heel kicks in the face. He endures it all just to get close enough. This had been his strategy all along, to get close enough and cuff the more agile opponent to his own arm. After that, brute force does the trick. With overwhelming strength, Marv knocks out the writhing Kevin and the victory. It says, surprisingly though, as Marv stands, regaining his breath, he hears a gentle flap of fabric and the familiar scent come his way. It was Wendy, pulling a gun on the unconscious Kevin. She asks Marv to let her shoot him and claim her revenge. Marv simply says that she just ignored his instructions and strayed out of the car. Before she can do a thing, Marv slaps her unconscious and carries her to the car. As she lies in the seat, we hear Marv's voice in the distance. Marv has sawed Kevin's limbs off, tied him up to a tree and has his wounds fixed up in tourniquets so that the man didn't manage to bleed out to death. We witness Marv's final stretch of the plan as he undoes the tourniquet on one of Kevin's legs. The smell of fresh, gushing blood beckons the wolf. Kevin remains unperturbed, his cold stare and lifeless lips curled up in that uncanny smile remains as bit by bit the wolf devours him alive. He never makes a sound to Marv's sheer horror. He doesn't scream when the wolf eats his guts open, not even when Marv saws the head off his body, finally killing him. After this whole ordeal, Marv leaves the unconscious Wendy with his old acquaintance Nancy. As she tends to his wounds and helps him out by giving him his fill of chilled beer, Marv puts her up to a task. Eventually, as Wendy would come to her senses, Nancy is supposed to explain to her that everything was fine, but that she must escape from the city. He adds that Wendy would end up getting killed if she doesn't manage to skip town as soon as possible. Nancy assures Marv that she would drive Wendy to the airport herself. Marv disapproves of the idea, saying that the airport would probably be watched as well. Rather, Nancy should drop her off to San Diego from where she'd be able to take a flight elsewhere. Marv adds that if Wendy makes a fuss about the plan, she's to be told that she owes Marv big time and that she ought to follow through with his instructions for that reason. Turns out, Marv has this entire plan chalked out because he anticipates that anyone connected to Goldie would face grueling police investigation, so it'd be best to skip town before anyone can come knocking at the doors. Of course, Marv's own quest was not yet over. He had to get to Rock, and he was yet to find all of his answers. After carefully covering his tracks, Marv finds a vantage point overlooking the mansion where the Cardinal lived. In all fairness, it ought to be called the Fortress Rock, as people generally did. It was Patrick's very own lair, armed and fortified with guards while senators and governors came calling to him for favors. Marv realizes that even though he would love to blow the entire establishment up, that'd hardly help his course. No, in order to get all his answers, he needed to play it real quiet and real dirty. It's now or never, Marv thinks as he plunges down the slopes from his vantage point. The guards, who are more than who are more like a mercenary death squad, are on the lookout for Marv as well, it seems, as they keep maintaining constant vigilance. Just as the guard posted out at the gate reports an all clear to the central, Marv jumps on him, making quick work of the man. He leaps into the premises. With more determination than ever, he makes his way through the compound, leaving bodies lying on the way. Patrick Henry Rock awakens. The sleeping cardinal thinks that it's Kevin who's called to visit. Marv agrees with the irony of his mistake, holding aloft Kevin's disembodied head in his grasp, adding that the dog ate the rest. Marv has his gun aimed straight at the cardinal, who's clearly made to understand that he'd meet his end if he tried to scream and alert the guards. Rock is a small, rotund little figure next to Marv as he breaks down on the floor, grieving over Kevin's fate. He calls Marv a monster for doing what he did to Kevin, to which he simply replies by saying that, unlike Kevin, he didn't go around eating people. The Cardinal snapped furiously, saying that Kevin was a pure soul who only ate those who had no worth in society, the prostitutes. According to Rourke, Kevin had come up to him as a child for confession, and that's where he learnt about his cannibalism. Strangely enough, Kevin had found a sympathizer in the Cardinal, as both of them were convinced that the eating would reveal the touch of God to him. As we come to know, Kevin only ever exchanged words with Rourke, who seemed to be unusually attracted to 
Kevin's voice as the man came of age. He adds that Kevin's deepening voice would fill him with pleasure. In time, the Cardinal joined his disciple in this twisted spiritual quest. The cover to this perversion blew up in their face, as one day when Kevin was busy doing the deed, Goldie had found out about their operation. Turns out, following the disappearance of the first few girls, she previously tailed the Cardinal's limousine to the farm. Horrified, she escaped to save her own life and staved with Marv for protection. That was when Rook hatched up the plot to frame Marv, because he would make the perfect candidate to pin the blame on. What none of them had anticipated was that Marv simply wouldn't give up. He wouldn't yield to thugs, police, and not even Kevin himself. At last, Rourke asks if Marv would have his satisfaction killing an old, helpless man. Marv looks him in the eye and says that the death was never meant to be satisfying. It was just everything he would inflict before. With that, Marv tells Rourke that he could scream now, if he wants to. Oh yeah, Marv has his way with him, all right. His inner self goes back to the promise he'd made to Goldie. Killing Rourke, turns out, isn't as unsatisfying as killing Kevin. It's a loud and nasty piece of work. Marv's very own kind of kill. Oh yeah, he whimpers and Marv laughs in his face. Yeah, he screams to God for mercy and Marv laughs harder. The deed was done. Guards storm in. It doesn't matter though. They open fire on Marv. As he'd surmised before, he doesn't have the good fortune to receive a bullet to the head. He wakes up a few days later in the hospital, dazed under the influence of anesthetics. The treatment drudges on, and so does the pointless trial. The cops fail to beat a confession out of him, but the judge gives him the electric chair anyway. The people get to know that Marv is the one responsible for the deaths of not just Kevin and Rock, but all of their victims, Goldie included. None of it matters to Marv. He gets to go out a winner in his books. 18 months on death row. The hour of Marv's death is imminent when he gets a single visitor in his cell. It was Wendy, and after once again confusing her for Goldie, he's assured that he can call her Goldie if he wants. So, that's what he does. With the night of passionate embrace, Marv finds himself in the arms of his goddess on the very last night of his life. His last meal is a decent steak, but he can't wait to get it all over with. They hit the vaults and the murderous tumults of electricity flow through his brain and body, sizzled from the inside. Marv utters his last words in true defiance asking if that's the best they can do, calling them pansies. Jolts of lightning course through his body, and then no more. The end comes at last. Marvelous verdict. Frank Miller's genius shines abundantly through Sin City. His immaculate use of minimalistic light as well as stunning visual imagery brings together this all-time classic. The storytelling itself is a gripping piece of art and has no doubt become a genre-defining body of work. Breathtaking visuals and gripping story aside, fans would surely recognize the noir elements that seep into Sin City from Miller's earlier work with Gotham City's betrayal in The Dark Knight Returns. Above all, Sin City is a must-visit recommendation for those who can't have enough of the crime noir experience.